guys. It's been a long time, like four months. You want to watch a moonrise with me? Maybe do a little bit of talking and catch up? Yeah, look at the moon. And tomorrow? Tomorrow? Wow. It's going to be like a lunar eclipse. The longest lunar eclipse in 580 years. So you don't want to miss it. It starts, well at least for me, it starts about 2.18 a.m. But um, let's, let's watch the moonrise and talk, okay? I, I missed you guys. The longest lunar eclipse in 580 years will be visible from North America starting at 2.18 a.m. this Friday, November the 19th. It will be a near total eclipse. That's like 95%. We are currently experiencing the Leonid meteor shower, which started seven, uh, November the 17th. So we've got a lunar eclipse uh, at the same time, happening at the same time as the Leonid meteor shower. Two weeks from now, there will be a total solar eclipse on December 4th, 2021. God's universe is working like clockwork. He has sent us signs in the heavens. Are we paying attention? Thinking about lunar eclipses, so what do the scriptures tell us? In the last days, there'll be signs in the heavens, right? That's what the Bible says. The moon will be turned to blood and the sun will be darkened. Okay, so today we understand what a lunar eclipse is, right? The earth passes between the sun and the moon and casts its shadow on the moon. And the light refracts. And when it passes around the earth and through the earth's atmosphere, it shifts into the red. And that causes the moon to appear blood red. Sure, we understand scientifically what's going on with a blood moon and with a lunar eclipse. And we understand what's going on with a solar eclipse. You know, the moon passes between the earth and the sun and casts its shadow on the earth, blocking out the sun. But just because we understand these things scientifically doesn't mean they are not signs in the heavens. Because if God is omniscient, if he's all-knowing, then he knows with an accuracy far greater than a supercomputer exactly the position of every planet, every star, every moon, every celestial object that he set into motion when he said, let there be light. He knew the orbits of all the planets and their velocity and the effect of gravity and momentum and inertia. And I mean, you don't think that, I mean, if, if we, his creation can build supercomputers and they can calculate the position of a planet or a star a billion years ago or a billion years in the future, you don't think the mind of God can do that? So just because we understand what these events are scientifically does not mean they are not signs in the heavens. They mark events, they mark things that happen, such as the Tetra, the four blood moons within two years, was it 2014 and 2015? So I do believe, you know, this, this is a significant event. I can't say what it is, but it just seems like a wake up call. You know, it's, it's the longest lunar eclipse over North America in 580 years. It's going to be over three and a half hours. And isn't it funny how the effect is localized? So we'll see it for over three and a half hours here in North America, but in the United Kingdom, they're only going to see it for six minutes. And because of the position where we're located, we'll see an almost total lunar eclipse, you know, almost 95% blocked, whereas in the UK, it will just be a partial eclipse. So these are signs in the heavens set to, to give messages to anybody who can tear themselves away from their television set and their computer screen long enough to go outside and notice. And in this case, it's going to be at 2, 18 a.m. on Friday morning that it starts for us here in Florida in the EST, in the Eastern Time Zone. But I feel like this is, this is a warning call. This is God saying, hey, wake up, wake up, you know, uh, things are about to happen. And we need to be ready. We need to be ready to stand before God. We need to be ready to meet God. We need to be ready for things that are going to happen. It's, it's in his kindness. He gives us signs in the heavens. I firmly believe that. And just because you can explain it away scientifically, it doesn't take the miracle out of it. It doesn't take the, the, the wonder and the amazement out of it. Don't you think God knew every solar eclipse, every lunar eclipse? By the way, two weeks later, after this lunar eclipse, there's a solar eclipse. But we won't see it, really, in North America. So many lunar eclipses, so many solar eclipses, and they work like clockwork and God's clock, marking prophetic events, marking things that happen. And I'm no prophet. I can't tell you what will happen in the future. I have no idea. But I feel like the Holy Spirit has prompted me to tell you, pay attention to the signs in the heavens. There's a meteor shower going on right now while there's a lunar eclipse. And then two weeks later, there'll be a solar eclipse. You don't think God knew that when he created the earth 
and the solar system and the heavens. God knew the position of every moon and planet and star. So pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on. Look at the signs in the heavens, meteor showers and lunar eclipses and solar eclipses and the whole tetrad that we just went through a few years ago. Definitely signs in the heavens. Another thing I've been thinking about, is there anybody out there who still has zeal and passion for Jesus? You know, I, people I've known that were strong Christians who were so passionate about the gospel, who, who knew the gospel, that we can't be saved by the law. We can't be saved by, by a bunch of rules. That's, that only schools us and lets us know that we need Jesus, that we can't make it without Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And, and we have to accept and receive that to find forgiveness. That the law schools us that we can't do it on our own, that we can't do it by ourselves. And what do you think politics is? Politics is rules, regulations, laws. It's carnality. It's, it's the attempt of flesh to rule over man. And if that could work, well, the Sanhedrin had that going on 2,000 years ago. They had a theocracy, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin. That was a religiously uh, ruled government, okay? And it ruled over the people, but did it bring them salvation? No, because if it did, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. Galatians chapter 3 says, O foolish Galatians, haven't begun by the Spirit. Do you now think that you can finish by the works of the law? Who has bewitched you? And today it would say, O foolish Americans. The church in America is in trouble because it's gotten so political. And it's, it's idol worship. We know he's a jealous God, and you don't think we're provoking him to jealousy when we give more passion and more zeal to a political party than we do to Jesus Christ? We're so busy trying to convert people to become a conservative or Republican, or we're trying to convert them to become a Democrat or a liberal. And, and both sides are trying to hijack Jesus and the Gospel and the Bible for their cause, and they're trying to claim that they're God's party, and neither one of them are God's party. It's all the, politics is all the devil's game, right? Politics is legalism. Right? Politics is, rejects the new covenant, which says that a person can only change from the, the inside out, not the outside in. Okay, Politics, it's a King Saul. When the church does, can't wait patiently for Jesus to be her king, and she has to have an earthly king, well, she's rejecting God, and, and she's choosing a King Saul. That's, that's what's happening. And you don't think we provoke the Lord to jealousy? I mean, why? I, I look on people's Facebook pages, and they're more interested in proving their political viewpoint than they are in sharing the gospel with somebody. And that's what lets you know where their heart is. If all they talk about is Joe Biden, that's where their heart is. If all they talk about is Donald Trump, that's where their heart is. If all they talk about is the Democrats or the Republicans, because Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So if your passion, your zeal, the, the, what you worship is Jesus, he's going to be what you talk about. But if all I hear you talk about is politics, that has become your God, and that is what you worship. You have left your first love. Man, where are some Christians with some spines? Where are some Christians who refuse to kiss the butt of the Republicans and refuse to kiss the butt of the Democrats, who refuse to give their loyalty to a political party or to a man when it only belongs to Jesus Christ? Where are those who pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God and, and the kingdom for which Jesus stands? You know, I just feel like he's, he's a jealous God and we're provoking him to jealousy and it's God gave me a dream. It's like this. It's like the Titanic, okay? I had this dream. That I'm on the Titanic. It's sinking. And there's these two groups of people, and they're, they're fighting for control of the ship. Well, um, you know, one group was the Democrats, one group was the Republicans. And they're just both fighting, and, and they're so sure if they get control of the ship, they can save the Titanic. But it's the Titanic. The hole has been ripped open by an iceberg, and it's sinking beneath the water. And everyone that stays on the Titanic is going to perish. They're all going to die. And it doesn't matter which party wins. It doesn't matter which group wins the struggle, wins the war. It doesn't matter if the Democrats win and they control the ship. It doesn't matter if the Republicans win and they control the ship. It doesn't matter. The ship is doomed. All right? What does Revelation say? He, God told his church, come out of her, my people. Come out of her. Come out of Babylon. For her sins have reached up to heaven and God has remembered all her crimes. Come out of her, my people. He didn't say stay in her and fight and win control of her and see if you can pass laws and legislation that, no, that's not what God said. God said, come out of her. So he's telling you to get off the Titanic. He's not telling you to stay on it and go down with the ship and sink beneath the waves. He's telling you to get to the lifeboat. Come out of her, my people. 
that you share not in her plagues and her punishments. That's what the scripture says in Revelation. God's telling you to get to the lifeboat, and the lifeboat is Jesus Christ. The lifeboat is not the Republican Party. They're going down with the ship. The lifeboat is not the Democrats. They're going down with the ship. The lifeboat is Jesus Christ, okay? He's the only thing that matters. We have one job. Jesus told us before he ascended, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. That was like the last set of instructions he left his disciples. And we're supposed to continue in that until he returns. So we can't take the passion and the zeal that belongs to Jesus, that belongs to sharing the gospel, the loyalty that we owe to Jesus and give it to a man. Give it to a corrupt human organization. Politics has always been the devil's game. Remember when Jesus fasted 40 days and he went into the desert? What was the last temptation he tempted Jesus with? He said, bow down and worship me. And if you do, I'll give you all the wealth and all the riches of this world. Now listen, if the devil was just lying and faking it, it wouldn't have been a real temptation. And how would God be glorified if Jesus didn't resist a real temptation? It had to be a real temptation in order for God to receive glory. Satan had to have the temporary ability to back up what he was saying, to offer Jesus the wealth and the riches of this world. So if 2000, over 2,000 years ago, if the devil was the crime boss running everything on earth, then don't you think he's still at it today? Until Jesus comes and kicks him off his throne, he's not the supreme God, capital G, but he's the little God, little tiny G of this world. Right? He controls the wealth, the kingdoms. So politics has always been the devil's game. It doesn't matter what party you believe in, what, what man you follow. When you go to the top, it's corrupt and it's rotten and it's wicked. And it's, it's, all, I mean, it's utterly controlled by the principalities and powers of this world, by Satan and, 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 and his henchmen. Okay, so politics, look, they came and they tried to make Jesus be king, right? And what did Jesus do? He rejected it. He walked away read it. It's, it's there in the Gospels. He set an example for us, all right? Our loyalty belongs to him, and our battle is not a, a carnal battle where we fight with flesh and blood, which is all you see in the news. Our battle is a spiritual battle where we wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness that we can't even see, invisible to the naked eye. So where does our loyalty lie? You know, we're the bride of Christ. We're the church. We have to keep faith with our spiritual husband, Jesus. We can't be getting into adulterous relationships and fornicating spiritually with politics. Politics doesn't belong in the church. It never has belonged in the church. It needs to be utterly separate. In Revelation, we're given a metaphor. You know, John has a vision of a harlot, a prostitute riding the beast, and she's all dressed in scarlet. And in her hand is a golden cup, and it's the wine of fornication. It's, you know, an abomination. And it says the kings of the earth got drunk with her. What are the kings of the earth? Politicians, rulers, presidents, prime ministers, okay? That's the king, that's what the kings of the earth represents. What's in her cup? That's what used to be the pure gospel of Jesus, but it's been mixed and adulterated with, with the fake gospel of this prosperity gospel and this gospel that you can do anything you want, anything that feels good and it's okay. And there's no such thing as sin. And it's the gospel that tries to mix religion and politics. No, the gospel's pure. The gospel's holy. And when you mix it with anything else, when you preach a different gospel other than the one that Jesus preached, like Paul said, let them be accursed if they preach a different gospel. So when you mix it with politics, when you mix it with sin, when you mix it with the love of mammon and money and prosperity, then it becomes a cup of adultery. And the harlot, what is a harlot? Someone who's unfaithful, someone who left her first love. The harlot is what used to be the bride of Christ, but she left her husband Jesus and she's whoring herself out with the kings of the earth. That's why it says the golden cup in her hand, the cup of adultery. You know, the wine that swishes around. Fornication is a metaphor, adultery is a metaphor for unfaithfulness to Christ. And the kings of the earth, that's the politicians, the politics. They grew drunk on her wine. They intermixed and intermingled themselves with the gospel. And they had no business and no place doing that. Again, God didn't tell us to go down with the Titanic and fight for her. God said, come out of her, my people, because judgment is about to fall. I believe all these things are being given to us in God's mercy to help us prepare for what's coming. You know? There's so many things, and you know, I don't have time to go over them all, but just open your eyes and look at the news. We're living 
in biblical times we're living in the, the end of days and nobody knows the hour nobody knows exactly when I know there have been thousands of wrong predictions and that's not what we're doing here we're not making a prediction Jesus said you could not know the day but he said you could know the season and that's all we're saying look we're in the season can't you see it in the heavens can't you see it in, in the evening news and are you ready what does it mean to be ready? That you know Jesus. And if you don't know him, you can know Jesus. Look, it's it's not something you can do on your own, right? If all my life I thought I tried to be a good person, all my life I went through the motions, all my life I was I was a religious person, but it was fake. It's on the outside. I, I was doing stuff to please my parents. I was doing stuff because I was raised that way. I, I, I would go to church. I would even volunteer and do things like volunteer in the soup kitchen or working with the choir but, but I was going through the motions and honestly I can't say that I really had a relationship with Jesus no when it changed for me you know and, and, and by the way there were sins that I struggled with all my life that I couldn't overcome bitterness unforgiveness anger against my dad sexual immorality I mean there were just horrible sins that no matter how hard I tried to be a good person I couldn't win the battle against those sins, those vices. They always got the best of me. And I always caved in and gave in to those, those sins. But when I met Jesus, here's what happened. The things that I couldn't do in my own strength, the sin that I could not overcome on my own, when he came into my heart, he overcame it through me. It, it wasn't my uh, willpower that did it. It was the power of God, the power of Jesus inside me. So I can't take any credit for it. Like the scripture says, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast in God's presence. You understand? It, it wasn't me, but it was Jesus in me. It was God in me. And there's a definite change. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Why do you have to be born again? Because the old you has to die. The scripture says we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm not yet what I need to be. I'm not yet perfect. Every day I, I mess up and I make mistakes and I sin and I get on my knees and I pray for forgiveness. But I'm not who I used to be. I can point to who I was three, four years ago. And, and I can look at myself now and I can say I'm not the, the person that I was. That old me died like a phoenix. It was burned up on the altar, utterly consumed by fire. And from the ashes arose a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, me. I, I don't talk the same. I don't walk the same. I don't dress the same. I don't eat the same. <laughs> I don't have the same friends. All the people that were my friends three, four years ago that hung out with me, they don't want anything to do with me now. They don't, they can't handle it because I'm not the same person. And, and people who wouldn't hang out with me three or four years ago, they've become my dear and close friends. Some of my closest sisters and brothers in Christ. So there's a definite change, right? Yes, it's by the grace of God. It's, it's not legalism. It's not by the law that we're saved. But there's a definite change. You've got to be born again. You've got to be a new creation. What's the point? If, if I remain the same, trapped in the same sense that I was trapped in years ago, then, then what would my testimony be? If I was still going out there and committing sexual immorality, if I was still full of bitterness and anger against my dad, how would I have any testimony at all? But if, I, if you can see a change in my life, and I'm nothing like what I was three, four years ago, the bitterness is gone, the unforgiveness is gone, the anger is gone, the sexual immorality is gone, well then you can say, hey, what happened to Curly? Why is Curly so different? And that, the answer to that is because of Jesus. So if you don't know Jesus, look, get away from your TV screen, get away from your computer screen, go out and watch this lunar eclipse tonight if you're in North America and you can see it and just get alone you and God and just talk to him you don't have to use these and those and you fancy words just talk to God like you talk to your best friend pour out your heart to him tell him you're sorry for the things that you've done we've all done things that are wrong we were born into sin we've all committed sin we've, we all have things we need to be forgiven for things we need to apologize for and just just pour out your heart to God and ask him to forgive you and if you do the scripture says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so you have God's guarantee you have God's word on it that if you will get on your knees and repent of your sin he will no longer hold it against you he will wipe your slate clean 
like you're a newborn baby and you can start again a brand new creation born again in Jesus born a second time the old you is gone and the new you has been born that's all you need to do to prepare to get ready for what's coming and then it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if the rapture happens tomorrow or the great tribulation or you know who knows this, or you die in your sleep or you die in a car wreck or maybe you live here another 50 years and you die of old age it doesn't matter that's not the important thing the important thing is being ready so that no matter when you die or whatever happens rapture or persecution or whatever you're ready to stand before God you're ready to meet him you, you have the blood of the lamb applied to the doorpost of your heart and you've been forgiven and you're a new creation and you were ready to and when God says why should I let you into my heaven you don't come to him in your own righteousness which is filthy rags but you say Lord I only have one plea and that is that your son Jesus Christ died for me that's what you say that's that's the only answer you can give God when you ask why should I let you in my heaven so tonight you have a chance to prepare look at the signs in the heavens look at the moon and the stars and the meteor showers and the planets and how they're all moving these are biblical times look at the way people treat each other the scripture told us things would be this way do you really think this is business as usual the pandemic the supply chain shortage our politicians fighting like elementary school kids name calling on twitter and and, and threatening to take each other's lives in congress do you think that's normal it's not normal at all all this chaos is happening because we are living in the end of days the stage is being set for antichrist for so many events but you don't have to worry about any of it even if you do, can't predict the future and you don't know the future it doesn't matter all you need to worry about tonight is preparing your heart to meet God just be ready and it's so easy all you have to do is pour out your heart to God and pray confess your sins and ask him into your heart and you will be born again and he will give you eternal life that's what he promised if you can believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world you can have eternal life hallelujah the moon so beautiful tonight isn't she gorgeous just look at her oh her beautiful light can you believe God made something so beautiful wow She's amazing. 